Hi, and welcome to the latest episode of Innovation Deciphered. Today I'm joined by a very special guest, all the way from Seattle, John Rossman, who's going to be talking to us about uh, Amazon's leadership principles and how you can apply them in your own business to obviously affect significant change and growth. And uh, really looking forward to this one. Hope you enjoy it. Well, hi, John. Um, glad you could make it onto the podcast today. Could you just give us a bit of background about what you've done before you got here? Absolutely. Tim, thanks for uh, having me. Great to be on Innovation Deciphered. My name is John Rossman. I'm a, I mean, the quick summary story. I'm a former, I was an early Amazon leader. I launched and scaled the marketplace business at Amazon in 2002. So that's sellers selling at amazon.com today that's about 58 percent of all units shipped and sold might also be part of the things getting them into a little bit of legal problems but uh that's that you know you've created a great business model when when that results uh later on down the road i left amazon in late 2005 i work with clients on innovation, making change happen, solving really hard uh, problems. Uh, a client of mine at the Gates Foundation, about five years after I left Amazon, came to me one day and said, you know, you do a nice job of delicately inserting some of the strategies from Amazon into our work. I think you ought to write a book, which was something I'd never thought about. So I started a journey of uh, being an author. So I've written three books and I have one more uh, releasing next year, which is not about Amazon, uh, but the three books are The Amazon Way, which is kind of my story at Amazon and the leadership principles at Amazon. It's a nice lightweight book. I wrote a book called Think Like Amazon, 50 and a Half Ideas to Become a Digital Leader. That's the complimentary full playbook of all the the techniques I learned from Amazon. And then I wrote a book about the internet of things uh, called the Amazon way on IOT. But, you know, all my work, whether it's keynote speaking or advisory work or, or the things that I write, it's always about helping others create change within their businesses so that they can compete and win in the digital era. Well, that, that's a very comprehensive answer, John, and thank you. Now, to our viewers and listeners, we'll put all of the links to those books in the show notes. So if if you if you didn't manage to scribble down those titles, they'll they'll be down there somewhere, so you'll be able to get hold of them. Uh, I know our viewers and listeners, John, are obviously everyone's Amazon's a great sort of um, uh, headline thing to talk about but it's not so much what happened in amazon it's what everyone can learn from how amazon achieved such fantastic growth and scaling and you know they did it in a number of in two industries didn't they they've got the oh, yeah. online store the amazon web services you and one could argue much more than two but yes i agree well there's two mega ones aren't there right right there's two mega ones so i mean that's what people are going to be really interested in. How how did that how did they manage to harness in the ideation, the innovation, and scale things? And I I know that the other the other thing that's really grabbing people's attention now it's a big big subject is AI and how uh, machine learning, automation, all of those things are going to accelerate uh, growth in the economy in the whole I, I, and I, I know from our own business the, the number of instances where we are using AI tools is uh, manifestly growing and having significant benefits so perhaps if we can talk about innovation in the age of AI uh, think like Amazon tell us tell us how to think like Amazon well so here's the the interesting thing about AI and and all of these uh, technologies, which is um, they're a tool. They're a tool to help you solve problems and create uh, experiences and to create efficiencies within your business. 
but they're not an end game in themselves. And so, you know, one of the Amazon leadership principles, the third one is invent and simplify. Invention sounds really interesting and hard and critical and, and highly valuable. Actually, it's the and simplify part of that leadership principle that I believe is the most valuable uh, part of that leadership principle and the important thing that you need to lean in on when you're applying AI or, or any other type of technology. The, the edgiest work I do with companies is simplifying, rationalizing, re-engineering, zero-based designing their policies, approaches, customer experiences, because they've all just been built with, you know, kind of a lack of a crisp designer's eye with really rationalizing what is needed. Now, with AI, you can, you can think of some use cases uh, that you probably couldn't think of before, but the most important work you need to do is understanding what the outcome, what the valuable outcome is you're trying to provide out of every process, function, step, activity that goes on, rationalizing why it's needed, is it needed, how to measure it, what's the most effective way to do it, and then applying technology or other approaches in order to instrumentate it and to automate it and to, to make it scalable in those ways. People get the order of those operations backwards all the time, all the time. They always want to leap towards applying technology. And I think that's one of the seductive things about so many of the, the generative AI tools is they are, they're, they're seductive, they're like magic, they, they work seemingly so well, but you, if you're really going to scale within an organization and have the types of controllable, observable, secure outcomes that you want, you have to really zero-based design and re-engineer those processes first and then apply them. And so that's the, the hard work that, that really has to be done. The technology is hard, but it's actually all the other things. And that's just the process work I've talked about. I haven't talked about the organizational change work that needs to go on, a lot of the incentives that need to be thought through, uh, the metrics that need to be thought through, how it can impact, you know, jobs and work and organization design. Like those are all of the other things that need to go on along with it too. So I absolutely get, start with the end goal and what the value is that you're trying to unpick through your processes. Is that sort of that process? What would people call that value stream mapping or something like that? As you, well, it, it, Amazon has their term for this, uh, which is called working backwards. And working backwards is all about starting with the customer, starting with the outcome that you want, and working backwards. At, at first, really starting with an unconstrained mindset. I think that that's super important. The other real magical thing that Amazon does, and this is a hard thing, is they write and debate memos about this. And so they have a specific set of memos that they talk about, a six-page narrative, a future press release, a set of FAQs, super lightweight prototypes. And doing that work helps the thinking and, and the group debate to really get at the bare metal essence of what you're trying to accomplish. And again, every team wants to immediately leap towards like the actual design work or the actual build work and things like that. Writing and debating memos is the cheapest way to actually do experimentation. Um, it is hard. It is a it, it's like jumping in cold water at first. It's a it's a bit of a shock of the system. But this is truly, I think, one of the uh, secrets that can be applied in so many instances from Amazon is how to write and debate complex, subtle business topics out and how that leads you to better thinking. And it not only leads to better thinking, Tim, but it, it leads to everybody understanding the, the important but subtle 
aspects or the secret or the the killer feature of what we're trying to get to. So your experiment can proceed better, faster, more on tune because we all actually understand the subtle, important aspects of what we're proposing we do. And do those memos, uh, I mean, how how big a problem or how big a, 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 of an investment is required before one of these is necessary? I mean, surely it's it's not down to, are we going to have a cup of tea at uh, midday or a cup of coffee? I mean, the, how, 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 at, what, at what level do you say, no, actually, we need to have a memo on that? Um, well, I mean, it certainly depends upon the situation and the team involved and the skill they have at doing this and everything. But I think if any any situation or problem, and, and, I, and I mentioned problems a number of times, this is a fantastic technique for doing correction of error or evaluating a situation that's happened in the business and then figuring out, well, what's the innovation, the improvement we can do out of that? But I think anything that is worthy of getting together a group of people and talking about and and deciding, well, what is the actual problem and what are we proposing to do about it? What do we, what's our hypothesis about how to fix this? I think any situation that kind of has that, that essence to it is worthy of at least a one page memo and then debate, well, what more, if anything, is needed from there. And that's where like any type of recommendation or technique, you know, wisdom is is really needed. You can't just apply with a set of, you know, automated rules of when to do something, how to do something, how long to do something. You know, I, I always get asked, well, how long does a memo take? Well, I mean, that that is highly variable again on not just the situation, but the skill of the team and the stakeholders and how we need to bring stakeholders along on this topic. All of those things, you know, drive a huge range of how long something like like the memo and debate process should take. That's I mean, that, that's fascinating. I, I mean, I've heard of these memos, but to actually hear it from a, a, a practitioner who, who, who was putting it into practice is really really fascinating yeah so so in, in the amazon way i i lean in on these and then think like amazon I, I talk about them even more but i got to write the the future press release for the marketplace business in 2002 and it was really hard work it didn't come to us immediately but you know one of the the leadership principles amazon's famous for is customer obsession right leaders start with the customer and work backwards they work vigorously to earn and keep customer trust and while they pay attention to competitors they obsess about customers that's the first and probably the most famous of the amazon leadership principles the hard thing we had to figure out was how does customer obsession translate to a third party selling business in 2002, all of Amazon's business was first party retail. All of it was books, music, video, by the way, at the time, right? And here we were going to go, go quickly into a number of new categories and third parties were going to be responsible for the content, for the proposal to the customer, for the offer to the customer, for fulfillment, for first level customer support. How does customer obsession translate into that and and by going through this debating and writing process what we came to was i think the single line that made all the difference in this business and that line was we wanted a customer to trust buying from a third party seller as much as they trusted buying from amazon the first party retailer now Pretty simple sentence, but if you actually unpack that and, and like, oh, that imposed a tremendous amount of obligation for both Amazon and our third party sellers. And then everything we did was engineered around that objective. And like you say, that's easily said, but the. How but the process of getting there was not easy. I can imagine it must have been massively complex and difficult and 
it, it, it just it took active debate. It took thinking about it and really internalize. That's why I think these leadership principles are um, are. Was this debate just internal with Amazon? Uh, primarily on this topic, yes, it was just internal. Okay. With him. It, um, and it really was a core set of leaders at Amazon. And then at times we would go to the S team and with Bezos and 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 have these discussions and everything. Because there's, I mean, it's very interesting because in the in the industry that I. I've spent a lot of my life in, which is construction. Those sorts of where you're trying to um, subcontract, if you like, uh, parts of a, a proposal. Getting those uh, obligations right is very difficult, and trying to get a unified uh, customer experience is well, it's never been achieved. I don't care what anyone says; it, it, it has never been achieved. And and oftentimes when you're going forward with a new proposition, a new capability, um, um, what what happens is you come up with a set of requirements. But at the end, it's really one lovable feature, one killer killer feature that will actually get a customer to transition from a, a current state to using your solution, and really recognizing and debating and then testing what you think that, I, I refer to it as a killer feature, some people like the most lovable feature, like whatever it is, the killer feature versus all of the other requirements. That What that does is that allows you to then test and develop and focus and prioritize that killer feature above everything else. But people just tend to put all these requirements as requirements. They don't focus in on like, what is the strategy for customer adoption? Like, what is the thing that we think will drive customer adoption? And then accelerate the testing of that and validating that that is, in fact, what will work. And that's one of the reasons why so many of these big transformations and innovation programs and new business incubation approaches don't work is because they don't scrutinize, recognize, and highlight the specific use case or feature that makes all the difference. And is that really about, it's partly to do with customer obsession, it's about innovation and simplifying. What is the, the absolute essence of it, I guess? Yeah. It, 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 you, you nailed it exactly. It's, it's that going through all of those things, understanding the problem, the customer, the situation, the job to be done, and really diving in, then really working out, well, what's our hypothesis for what the future needs to be? And, and really chewing on that back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then making what can oftentimes be the hard decision on, well, what do we think the specific feature or capability is that makes the difference? Because oftentimes, there's different points of view on that. And, you, and that's where one of the leadership principles is about have backbone, disagree, but commit. And that's all about making decisions, having these discussions, but then deciding who the decision maker is and allowing them to make a crystal clear, undiluted decision, a bet on what they think the situation is, and then proceeding at pace in order to test it. That's interesting. So is that the, that's the third part of the jigsaw, which is have backbone, have a discussion, debate things out, and then collective commitment, I guess. And and it's it's difficult to have pointed, opinionated, fact based conversations and do it in a respectful way, right? Like that's one of the hard, delicate things, but actually by doing these memos and having memo debate meetings, that helps uh, make it less personal. That helps really focus on like our the job that we need to do is to actually be critical and debate these topics. I always talk about being an active skeptic, right? An active skeptic, uh, means that you engage, but you're always looking for evidence and insight and truths um, relative to the situation. And so many times people are either, they're kind of passively aggressive, meaning meaning like they kind of behind the scenes, like they'll, they'll snipe at something, they'll be critical of it, but they won't 
in the moment, or we don't um, because we want our cultures to be so consensus driven and 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 collaborative. We aren't willing to have the 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 specific what I'll call hard conversations about, well, what is the specific thing we are going to do here? And and that's just some of the delicate work that needs to be done within a company. So these principles that drove the culture within Amazon? Yes, sir. Yeah, it, it, they, they really are you know, the the backbone, the starting place for, you know, how do we work together? What do we prioritize? Um, how do we hold each other accountable? What do we think are the unique things about our culture? Don't try to put too much um, into these principles. I, I, I've, I've written three editions of this book, The Amazon Way, been translated in 13 languages, uh, sold a couple hundred thousand copies of it. The third edition, which I released a year ago, I put in a new appendix and it's about building your leadership principles. And so I kind of give like my suggestions on how to go about it. Again, don't recommend that you take in singularity or entirety Amazon's leadership principles. No, but you should think through like, what's our set of tenants or principles? I I, I don't like the word rules, um, a p- philosophy on how we work together, what we prioritize, uh, how do we debate things? How do we make hard decisions? What do we expect from each other? And if you can come up with a, a set of rules like that is scalable culture right there. I mean, that's fascinating, everything we've just heard about. And how does that culture with these principles, how did that influence the shape of the organization? The, what did that lead to? Well, well um, it's just one mechanism, right? And so, so uh, principles or or commonly defined, explicit ways we work together then needs to be married with like you know all the things around your strategy, your organization structure. But the most important thing is that it influences how you hire people. It influences how you work together in day-to-day meetings. It impacts how you evaluate people. And so if you tie those things together, they they help to create a, a much more refined and um, specific way that your organization works. And one that hopefully is differentiated in the market so that you actually win in the market. And um, I think that's one of the mistakes that people make about culture is they think that that culture can't really be defined. I, th- I absolutely think that culture can be and should be uh, defined within an organization and that you're trying to make your culture so that it's the right thing for everybody. And that's actually I, I don't I don't think that's the goal. I think the goal is to make it a culture that is the right culture for the right people to help your organization win. And and so be being willing to be very explicit and very proud and making hard decisions from from that defined set of principles, I think, is one of the real hallmarks of how you create a high performing organization. It's and and I suppose this was also. This is a this must be all about the leadership of Jeff Bezos as well, that this approach. I mean, he was an analyst, wasn't he, beforehand? Well, um, he he certainly was the key stakeholder in this. But but you know, Jeff was super is super smart. Was super smart about you know letting others contribute to this. That he didn't have all of the insights uh, starting off. I think he really started with an understanding of kind of customer obsession and customer centricity. But then it was really a number of the other leaders who brought in operational excellence and how we make decisions and things like this. And so one of the keys for making leadership principles real is that leaders actually need to not just be involved in, they need to be the biggest cheerleaders, the biggest users of these leadership principles. And when I work with a team in like, hey, let's let's lean in a little bit on like our culture and our leadership principles, the key is getting the leader and that direct leader team. So I'll, I'll say it in terms of like the CEO and the executive leadership team. 
they have to use these leadership principles as how they work together. And then that change trickles down, right? That's fractal theory at work across the organization. And if too many times the, the, the CEO or the leadership team is like, yeah, I just want really everybody else to change. Like I, the way I do my work is it doesn't need to change. I, I'm not, but everybody else needs to. And they, they give kind of lip service that undermines any type of, of chance you have of really making an impact. I think that's, that's really, really important, isn't it? Because leadership's got to be authentic and you've got to, it's the old expression that walk the talk. Absolutely. You have to, yeah. So, John, that's been fascinating. I just, I mean, this whole concept about how to perhaps think and act like Amazon to make your business a success, because I, I, I think those principles that you've talked through and how it impacts culture and organisational design and structure and how it trickles down from the top, that can be applied to any business, can't it? And I'm sure you've probably experienced that in your consulting career. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I mentioned um, I got to do a, a long piece of work with the Gates Foundation over seven years worth of work, and we worked with all their grantees. Um, and and if you think making change is hard with within companies, you know, try doing it within uh, nonprofit organizations. Like it actually is really hard to 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 create a differentiated product and service and and organization and a high performing team. But I got to use these. That's why I've really refined all of these approaches and techniques. Because again, it's not about being Amazon. It's about being the best high performing differentiated organization that you can be and being being planful about that being being thoughtful about how you actually do that well john it's been utterly fascinating listening to you uh, i know it's this morning for you it's this afternoon for me and i thank you very much for coming on this uh, fantastic well it's a really great episode of innovation deciphered and I wish you well in your uh, your book launch. I think your latest book is out 27th of February next year. Yeah, the that book is called Big Bet Leadership: Your Transformation Playbook for Winning in the Hyper Digital Era, and it it really is the story of how my work since I've left Amazon and incorporating these approaches into different environments and and um, a number of different instances, and it's targeted for senior leaders to help address the specific reasons why these big bets, all these transformations uh, fail. So yes, releases uh, February 27th, it'll be hardback Kindle and it'll be a really nice audio book. Uh, we wrote it for a, a great audio experience. And you can, well, you can John, learn more at bigbetleadership.com. You heard it here first, folks. So, well, everyone, thanks very much for listening. See you on the next podcast. Bye.